Good morning. I had a slide for you to look at, but this morning when I opened up the PowerPoint, my cross with the names of Jesus was not there. It's at home. So if we only get in our cars and go home and look at that slide and come back, then, but otherwise, just picture a cross with the names of Jesus on it. From there, one of my pet peeves over my entire life has been movies that depict Christianity as weak. How many of you have ever seen a movie where the priest gets beaten up by some satanic figure even though he's spouting the name of Jesus, even though he's holding a cross, he's, he's getting beaten up. I've seen that enough in my life to know that, that it happens and they have a low regard. And if we haven't noticed in recent times, there's a lot of things going on in our society that are the opposite of what Jesus says. And this is one that's been going on a long time. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Uh, and, and we got a glimpse of that in the first century when Jesus walked around. What did the, what did the demons do to Jesus when he approached them? Did, did Jesus get beaten up by any demon at any point in his three years? Not once. As a matter of fact, it was the opposite. The names of Jesus are Prince of Peace, Light of the World, King of Kings, Holy One, the Christ, Wonderful Counselor, Emmanuel. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the beginning and the end, otherwise known as Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, Messiah, the Bread of Life, Jehovah, Strong Tower, Lord of Lords, Lord of Lords, and most importantly, our Savior. There's power in his name. And so if we've had a, a rough last week, maybe you got attacked. If you're a Christian, you were. Because Satan can't afford to have anybody go to heaven. It's his job, it's his desire that everyone goes to hell with him. So he's going to attack and has the power to attack. And, but we have the name of Jesus. That's the power that we have to stop that. And that's my encouragement to you this morning as we begin this next worship service for a whole new week that, we're, that don't, be, don't be disillusioned or discouraged by the things that we see in this world that Satan is putting in our path to take our eyes off of the prize. his name, we can say it, and demons will flee. So should we worship Jesus? Should we take some time now, this next hour, to revitalize ourselves and, and be stronger when we leave? Let's do that. Shall we stand together and pray? Let's do that. We thank you, Jesus, for being that strong tower that we can rely on we thank you for being our Savior so that the things that Satan might put in our path as individuals, we can have victory over them because your blood has covered us. Help us to be found faithful. Help us to, when we hear those trumpets sound, we will hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. We give this hour to you in praise and thanks for all that you've done. Jesus, it is in your name that we pray this. Amen. I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, oh Lord, praises to your name, oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. 
I give glory to your name, O oh Lord, glory to your name, O oh Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O oh Lord, glory to your and greatly to be praised. For your name is great and greatly to be praised. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of Jesus, the name that charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and peace. My gracious master and my God, assist me to proclaim. Tis spread through all the earth abroad, glories of your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when found in a desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be Sing you pour out a turn back to praise when the darkness closes in Lord still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your God Shining down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're here. Uh, there was something that I was told I forgot last week, and so I have decided that since it's been seven days and I remember it, I better do it. I forgot to have us sing happy birthday to Kathy Kaufman, whose birthday was last Sunday. So we're going to do it today. <laughs>
I just love surprises, don't you? <laughs> How many of you are 65 or older? Just raise your hand. It's okay. You can, you can admit to it. 65 or over. How many of you felt aches and pains being 65 and older? Huh? 65 and older? Good. All right. All right. How many of you feel like things have just fallen apart every once in a while, right? Well, this building, this part of the building is about 65 years old, almost 65 years old, and it's falling apart. That's why we don't have heat today. We've got boilers that work, but we have pipes that leak, kind of like some of us. And so, <laughs> and so in the library, there's, there was a massive leak yesterday, or last week that we didn't know about until Sunday afternoon. And that leak caused no heat in here. We didn't know that at that time. It also leaked down into the, the room direct, directly below. And so that is going to be fixed. My plan was it was going to be fixed on Friday. Um, their plan was we don't have the parts. We'll be back Monday. So if you are cold today, you can either wrap yourself in a blanket or you can snuggle in Jesus' name only. Okay? All right, so let's stand and greet one another.
been a very long time since we've introduced a new song. And this Sunday morning, uh, we're going to sing a, a new song, even though it's a Chris Tomlin song from 2010, which means it's already 13 years old. Uh, if you know the song, sing it along with me. Uh, if uh, you don't know the song, you've become more comfortable with it, sing it, sing it along with me. Let's give it all to him and his son. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. simple chorus, very simple words. Let's do it again. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe
Good morning. Scripture today, give you a chance to start moving in that direction, Romans 8, verses um, 12 through 17, Romans 8, 12 through 17, reading from New King James. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For you, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Let's pray. Our God, we pray at this time that you would keep our hearts and minds open to the uh, scripture, that you would be able to have us be in tune with the uh, message that John, that Don is going to proclaim this morning. We would ask that um, you would comfort us, enable us to have ears that hear and hearts that will receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Raise your hand if you remember the scripture text that I preached from last week. Great. Great. That's a zero. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. And we continue. We continue in Romans chapter 8, in uh, beginning of verse 12, where Paul 
again, contrasts the two ways of living, uh, living according to the flesh or living by the power of the Spirit. So living by the uh, way of the flesh is to live that which is transient, that which is pursuing uh, self-interest at the expense of others, and it also ignores the presence of God. But living by the power of the Spirit leads to life. Now, there are some words in this text that I'd like you to focus on today as we go through the uh, verses 12 through 17, and that first word is debtors. Most everybody understands what it means to be in debt. It means to owe something. If you've ever uh, bought a house, most of us probably did not pay cash and pay for it completely in one shot. Anybody here do that? How about a car? You know, uh, most of us don't uh, uh, take all of our money and we buy the car and we're done paying for the car. We have no more debts regarding that. But maybe it's not just a matter of of financial debt. Maybe it's something by favor of family or friends. Did you ever hear, uh, you owe me one, right? You owe me one. Uh, You're in debt if somebody says that to you typically. And so we start thinking of ways how we're going to pay a person back, how we're going to return a favor. But Paul is not talking about that at all. As you look at this passage of scripture, actually what he writes to the Roman Christians as well as to us is how we live is a matter of life and death. That's what the idea of being in debt is all about. So Paul writes in verse 13 of our text, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. Those are good words, aren't they? That's an either-or. That's not something where you say, well, there's got to be something in between here. Because quite honestly, the flesh, again in the sense of sinful flesh and rebellion to God, gave us nothing good. So we have no obligation to oblige or to pamper it because our debt is in the Lord and not in the flesh. Now there is a second word. You're going to think, wow, only four words and he's already through number one. All right, we'll see. The word bondage is found in that passage of scripture that is living As a child of God means an intimate, joyful relationship with God and not like the bondage of fear demonstrated by sinfulness. Because when we live in sin, we're not free. When we choose the ways of the world, we're not free. But when we live in the Spirit of God, we are certainly free. That's the promise that we have. There's a Christian writer by the name of Francis Schaeffer. If you've ever read any of his stuff, you're going to find out he's a very interesting person. What I have just described to you, he describes as what is called the bohemian lifestyle. It's kind of an interesting phrase because the first thing that came to my mind when I read about this was a song that was made popular back in the 1970s, but it makes sense. And while this often refers to uh, those that are involved in the arts, it's actually a social and cultural movement that has as its core a way of life away from society's conventional norms and expectations. So when Uh, Francis Schaeffer puts it into context, he says it's really our movement away from the things that are God's, and God's normal, as God as normal can be, he's the one that set the standard of normal. There's a person by the name of Gillette Burgess who describes this bohemian lifestyle this way. He says it is a light and graceful philosophy, but is the gospel of the moment. In Bohemia, one may find almost every sin except that of hypocrisy. See where we are now? He said, what then is it that makes this mystical empire of Bohemia unique? And what is the charm of its mental fairyland? It's this. There are no roads in all of Bohemia. One must choose and find one's own path, be one's own self, and live one's own life. See what the problem is? The problem is living by the flesh, living in darkness where there is no guidance, no direction whatsoever of God because we have chosen to throw God away. So it's the desire to cast off the values that we've been given by God through Scripture and do whatever we please. It doesn't matter what God says. What happens then is there's really no freedom. I like this passage of scripture where it says when we have life in the spirit and we come to a point in our lives where we're going to come to the third word, by the way. Wow, he's getting through this quick. It's going to be a short sermon. No, it's not. Okay, so here's this phrase. We cry out, Abba, Father. 
That's in reference to us becoming a part of the family of God. Abba, Father, really, if you were to, to uh, put it into today's phrasing, and what it means is you're calling God Daddy. He's not just simply a father. That is, he gave us life, he gave us birth, that sort of thing. It's that he's Daddy, that he takes care of us. It's interesting that we would think of Jesus relating to the Father with this confidence. We may think we're disqualified from it. However, if we remember, we're in Christ, and we have the privilege of relating to God in that same way, even as Jesus does. We get to call him Abba Father. We get to have a personal presence with our God. Now, here's that third word that tells us about that, and that word is adoption. Most of you probably remember me telling you that we adopted our three daughters back in the 1980s. It was a big time back then. We got the middle one first, who wasn't even middle yet. She was only the younger. I'm going to tell you this, and you can try to figure it out yourself. And then six months later, we got the older daughter, who became the oldest daughter eventually. And then after we adopted the two of them together, then a few months later, uh, the youngest was born. And so Trisha no, no longer was the only child or the younger child. She was the middle child. And then, and then we finally were able to get Barbara after she was about three or three and a half years old, and she came to be a part of the family. We adopted her. We have all three girls. We adopted them, and uh, it was because we loved them. All part of the same family, same mom, same dad, but we got them at three different times, and we raised those girls, and the majority of you have met all three of them. And know who they are. And we have an extended family, of course. And I think what happens when we look at the Bible and we talk about our adoption as sons or as daughters, that we realize that we're not the only ones. That we are not the only Christians in the world. That we are not the only Christian in this building. But instead we have an extended family who are adopted as children of God. And the Bible tells us that, that, that at that time we were saved, we were adopted by God into his family. Listen to what Paul writes, first of all, to the Galatian Christians. He said, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. You see, it took a Savior to bring us into this family, completely. He writes to the Ephesians, Ephesian Christians, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, to get an appreciation, a proper appreciation of the word adoption into God's family, I think we need to understand what Paul was talking about when he said that word. Paul is writing to the Christians at Rome. And under Roman law, there were certain things that took place when someone would adopt a child. For example, the adopted child lost all of his rights in his old family, but he gained all the rights as a legitimate son in his new family. And that's pretty much like it happens here. The adopted child became an heir to his new father's estate. If a son was later born to his new parents, he didn't lose any of his inheritance just because he was adopted. He was a legal and full child of that family. The old life of the adopted child was wiped out, including his debts. He was regarded as a new person, and his past was his past. Now that kind of rings a little bit something in here, like why, why would a baby have debts? Why would he have something that he owed? Well, not only babies were adopted, by the way. Did you know that? Sometimes they're older and quite a bit older, and they ended up being in another part of a family, a different family. But that adoption was legally binding. The adopted child was full and a complete child of the adoptive father, as if he were naturally born. Now, when you were saved, you were adopted into God's family. And guess what? Some of the same things apply here. You lost all your rights in your old family, you were a child of the world, and now you're a rightful heir of Jesus. That's what you've gained. Lost all that other stuff. Isn't that great that you've been uh, completely made over? You became an heir of your heavenly father's estate. 
And God is rich beyond measure. Now, if you're thinking money, forget it. Because he owns everything, and it doesn't have to do with money. He is the creator of all things. He owns all things. He's multiplied all things to bless his children, who are his heirs. The sin of your past life is wiped out when you were adopted by God. The slate is wiped clean. How do you like that? Your slate is wiped clean. Did you hear me? You are forgiven. You're, you've got a new nature about you. You're born again as a child of God. That's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. Because now your adoption into God's family is legally binding, spiritually binding, biblically binding. God is not going to unadopt you because he doesn't like the way you dress or doesn't like the words that you say sometimes. He's not going to unadopt you. There is nothing, listen to me, there is nothing that's going to separate you from God. This is what Paul writes again in Romans still, chapter 8. Let me get to it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do we have an amen there? If we aren't confident by now, even by reading just that passage of Scripture, I don't know where we're going to get our confidence. Because Paul is saying it like it is. Now Jesus kind of gives us some stuff beforehand. And he's reminding us of who we are in the family. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's what a, that's what a father cares about. Father cares about his sheep. He cares that they follow his voice. Now, if you've been adopted into God's family, you're going to be led by the Spirit of God. You may not always go where you are led. Did you hear me? You may not always go where you're led. Sometimes we lead, and there's nobody that's going to follow. Sometimes we teach, and there's nobody that's going to learn. And yet we still do it because God still is, is who he is and he leads us because we are part of his family. But we are being led by the Spirit of God. It's up to us to make the choice of whether we're going to follow. Let's look back in our text, chapter 8, beginning of verse 8. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You see, there's a, there's a contrast. There is something that we are offered that we can have, that we can take with us, that we can be excited about, and we don't have to be in bondage anymore. But those that are outside of God's family live in constant fear. Where am I going to be five seconds after I close my eyes in death? If you're a Christian, do you ever wonder that? Think about that for a moment. If you're in Christ, you know where you're going to be five seconds after death, right? Right? Those outside of Christ are going to wonder, is there really an eternal place called hell? Is there really an eternal place called heaven? They're going to wonder, will I be judged for my sins for the life that I live for not following God? And maybe they're thinking to themselves, if there really is a God, I'm in big, big trouble. In fact, I know some Christians that think that. Those that follow Jesus, but there's something about this idea where, I don't know if I'm really good enough. Guess what? You're not. Do you hear me? You are not good enough. You are not good enough. I'm not good enough to stand in the presence of God. I am not good enough, and you're not good enough, but you know what? It's not good enough to be good enough anyway. That's why we've got the grace of God. That's why we've got that free gift freely given us. That's why he wants to adopt us as his children. 
Oh, we're already creations of him, but we get to make the choice of what family we want to be a part of, either gods or the world's. Okay, so now if we're part of the family of God, there's, some, there's this fourth word, folks. Don't start packing up your stuff yet. Heirs. If we're part of the family, we get to be heirs. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. So if we're adopted into God's family, you are an heir of God along with his son, Jesus. That means you have a rich inheritance waiting for you. I remember often my mother saying to me, I don't have anything that, I'm, that I can leave you. I have no money. I said, I don't care about your money. I'm more of a sentimental guy. I said, I want, I want the pendulum clock and a red candy dish. And I got the pendulum clock. I didn't care if she had any money. She could have been a bazillionaire if there is such a thing, and it wouldn't matter to me. It wouldn't bother me a bit. She didn't give me a single penny out of that. I'm more of a sentimental. I wanted the stuff that reminded me of life having once lived. I like that kind of thing. But guess what? No matter what I got, if she gave me half a bazillion dollars at her death, I still have a better treasure waiting ahead of me for eternity. Now, you aren't saved because you want the inheritance you're going to receive, right? But when you're saved, you'll receive the inheritance as a result of of your salvation. If you're adopted into God's family, you will have a future inheritance to enjoy. And as heirs of God, we not only get to partake in a, the present inheritance, that is the life we live in Christ, but we have the future eternal one. But you know, along life's path, uh, there are things that happen. There are difficulties of life. I asked you a little bit earlier how many of you are 65 or older and are and your pipes are getting rusty and they break. <laughs> you know, it does happen. And there are other things that happen. But we maintain our faith because we trust in God. This is what, what uh, Paul writes in chapter 8 of Romans in the last part of verse 17. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I want you to not to think about the troubles of this life, but the excitement and the joy of the next one. Our enjoyment in being a child of God is limited on this earth. But we're going to enjoy the full inheritance when we get rid of this old body. We get rid of all this stuff, and that's when the adoption actually becomes totally 100% complete for all of eternity. I read the story of a young couple that visited an orphanage which housed several children for adoption. The caretaker brought several children who were clean and well-dressed, properly schooled in manners, for this couple to meet. And as the couple passed down the line and they spoke to each of the children, they really didn't seem to catch on to anyone in particular that they wanted to adopt. And they asked the caretaker, do you have any more children? The caretaker said, yes, but he's really not been cleaned up. He's not dressed for visiting today. The couple said, we want to see him. The caretaker went, and after a few minutes, that child was brought out and stood with the rest of the children. He had a dirty face. He was unkempt, hair uncombed, clothes ragged and torn, no shoes. Kind of hung his head in shame as he went and stood with the other children. After a few minutes of discussion, the couple came back and they were wiping their tears from their eyes and they said to the caretaker, we want this child. And the man immediately said, but he is not as nice as the other children. He actually misbehaves, doesn't have many friends here. He's always dirty like this, doesn't wear his shoes. We try to get him to behave, but we can't seem to get him to do what we want him to do. And why do you want him? The couple replied, we see in him the blessings of God for our home and a better hope in life for him. The caretaker kind of stood there with a little bit of shame, it seems. He says, do you want us to clean him up? The couple said, no, we want him just as he is. And that's how God sees us. He's going to take us as we are right now. And when he gets us and we become a part of his family, guess what? He'll do the cleaning up. He'll do the cleaning up. That's the cool thing about it. What about you today? Where are you in this relationship with God? 
I believe that we are all here, and we have all claimed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We are a part of his family, not just because of those words, but because we submit our lives to him, not only repenting of our sins, but being baptized into Christ and raised in a newness of life. But how do we view this adoption? Are we a little frustrated because we couldn't get it all together in this world? Or are we really totally excited because we did get it together with Jesus Christ and he forgives us when we do wrong and he restores us when we've fallen away and he loves us no matter what? So ponder that in your hearts today. We're going to stand and sing this morning And we want to give you an opportunity at any given time to to renew and refresh your relationship with him. You can do it where you're seated. You can come forward here so that we can pray with you, whatever is necessary. And if you haven't given your life totally to Jesus Christ, if you haven't been baptized into him, we offer that to you because the scriptures reveal to us a union with Christ like nothing else. Will you stand with me as we pray? As we sing. Savior, I come, I am my soul, remember, relentless hill where your blood was filled, my ransom. Uh, what is it that um, causes us to uh, recall things or bring things to remembrance? Um, something um, in conversation this week that I had with, uh, with our daughter um, brought some things to mind. Um, she said, uh, Dad, I, I, I know that uh, Grandpa Gibb was close to me today. And um, I said, oh, what, what, what occurred? She said uh, there was a, a phrase at work. Somebody said uh, uh, this phrase, and it just uh, was the same thing that, uh, that your dad would have said. Um, and we kind of laughed about it and uh, uh, said, yes, that's exactly what we recall that, that he said. Um, maybe... Uh, in, in some cases, it's a, a phrase, as this was. Um, I recall at one point uh, uh, smelling something that was from my childhood. And I don't know if you've ever had that occur to you, just a, a, a sight or a smell or something that affected your senses that uh, would, bring, would bring a remembrance. Um, I was... Uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough to uh, uh, live in about uh, 10 different places before I ever turned 10. Uh, Mom and Dad seemed to have this propensity to roam around a lot. 
I don't know if we were gypsies. I sometimes thought we were. Um, but we never stayed in one place very long. But some of those things come to mind. And if I am in the region, because all of them were uh, not too far away, uh, and drive down that street, then I have remembrances of some of those homes. Um, it, it, it's interesting about what causes us to, to remember. In Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, uh, verse 25, partially of 26, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. I think we come uh, at this point uh, in our service every, every Lord's Day, first day of the week, um, trying uh, very hard not to make this a routine, but to make it a special uh, kind of occurrence. In Luke, Jesus says, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He also says, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Is there anything that you do in remembrance of someone close to you or someone that you recall. This is a special time, and Jesus calls us every Lord's Day to do this in remembrance of him. Let us pray. Our God, we have many, many thoughts. We have many, many things to contend with, but we set aside this time to recall Jesus' sacrifice, his body, and his blood for our sake, that we might take them as our stepping stone for the week, that we might consider what Jesus did for each and every one of us, and pray that we will carry him and he will carry us through the week. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
So I had a couple of uh, responses for uh, a number of baptisms from a couple churches. I, I want to, to again remind you that they're rejoicing where they are. And I hope that we're rejoicing where we are for them. Um, I mentioned last week that we have not only opportunities but an obligation to plant a seed or to water the seed that's already been planted. I hope that you did that this past week. I hope that you found the people that you can connect with, that you can talk about your faith, you can talk about Jesus freely, but also invite them to come and worship with you because that's an important factor as well. And maybe something will inspire them and encourage them to give their lives completely to Christ. And uh, we have hosted the Lifeline screening here at Lockman Christian Church on many, many occasions. They're, be, they're going to be here again on the 15th of November. If you are interested, we've got some information, of course, on the screen. But we have on the table in the foyer a stack of those pink sheets that they send. It has all the information that you might want to have. If you're interested in that, uh, then make a phone call. Everything's down in the fellowship hall. Easy access to get there if you want to do that. And of course, uh, we have our annual meeting that's coming up on the 19th of November. Uh, we must announce this. And uh, uh, we have uh, the budget to talk about. We have uh, our goals and direction. We have the approval of a couple of deacons, we hope. And uh, so we want to make sure that, OK, we've got two deacons. And I'm going to announce their names, all right? So would the famous Tony Gates please rise? Stand up. Tony Gates is one. Steve Williams. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm really excited about these two guys. Okay, you can have a seat. We're going to, now, now if you remember, for many, many years, uh, we, we have been doing things biblically. That is, we don't vote for anybody. What we do is we give you an opportunity to to indicate your support of the two guys that have already been chosen. And what happens when you get what's called a ballot, for some reason, we, we give you a ballot, we'll have his, their two names on it, and uh, other deacons that might be up to, to, to re-up, if you will. And uh, uh, we give you an opportunity to make a check mark. Yes, you're going to support them as deacons. And uh, if you don't want to support them, you just check no, but we'd kind of like to know why. You know, for example, is... Uh, is, is Tony Gates a, a fan of Ohio State? You know, then we'll have to say, maybe. <laughs> um, so at any rate, we're going we're gonna to go that route. It uh, gives you that opportunity on November 19th. The meeting does not take very long. We want you all to stick around to the point where we're not even going to have a closing prayer until the meeting's over. That way you have to stay because we're going to lock the doors. Sherm's going to be our guard, all right? So uh, just, just go ahead with that. On the uh, 26th of November, we're going to have the hanging of the greens following the morning worship time, and uh, that's when, when all your creativity comes out. So if you all want to stay, is there going to be food? We Susan? haven't decided yet whether we're going to stay and be here or go in mass to another side. Well, Susan says stay, so it's probably going to be stay. Uh, Rachel, Rachel says stay. stay so I, I believe that's upper management. Yes. So, so, so if upper management says you're staying, then you're I'm not sure upper management is what I would call it, but that's, <laughs> I think, <laughs> that's good. That's good. Okay. So uh, all of you are invited to stay. Uh, there, there's going to be some kind of food somewhere. All right. All right let's stand together as we close. God, we really do have a joy about this family, and I pray that um, we continue to acknowledge that we are your adopted children, that we are heirs to a greater fortune in eternity than anything that's matched here. Father, I pray that you'll walk with us, you'll guide us, you'll keep reminding us of who we are in you, that we may live that way. We give you praise and honor and glory, in Jesus' name, amen.